Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. I'm very pleased to introduce or to reintroduce Glenn Anderson. To many of you, you know, Glenn is a long time IBMer. So um, we have Glenn for this fantastic presentation today. And Glenn, uh, please feel free, you know, to to tell everybody how you are enjoying the retirement from IBM. What are, what are you up to now? And then we can start whenever everybody will join. Yeah, it's nice to see uh, a few names I recognize. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark Nelson, Jim Horn. Boy, it's fun to uh, see everybody. Too bad we can't all be there face to face in person. That would have been that would have been really fun. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, I mean, most of you know I retired from IBM a couple of years ago, and uh, I've been keeping myself entertained with my own little one-man speaking business here. So this session is one of the sessions that I offer to conferences and and companies and organizations that are looking for some uh, speaker or some workshops or something in the area of professional development and, and team building, that kind of thing. Anna, are you waiting a, a little bit for more people or do you want me to go ahead and actually start the presentation? Um, maybe, you know, we can just wait uh, like, you know, another 30 seconds and then you can start, please. Sure. Because I see sure. that, you know, there are people still joining. So just, yep. you know, another 30 seconds and then. Um, nope, no problem. To... Okay, uh, Glenn, the stage is all yours now. All righty, thank you very much, Anna, and thanks to all of you for joining our session, which is an exploration of the phrase, yes, and. So let me, let me start by asking a question. Do some of you struggle these days to really create a collaborative work environment? Uh, is the team that you're part of, the task force, the organization that you work for, are, are they really working together? Are they supporting each other? Are they respecting each other? Well, if these are some of your challenges today. I want to encourage you, and you're probably going to find this hard to believe, I'm going to encourage you to think like an improv actor, to think and say yes and. Now, many of you uh, know me from my decades of time teaching and speaking at IBM, but what you might not know is that I also have spent most of my adult life performing improvisational comedy. So let me begin with a story that comes from that experience. I was standing on the stage of a comedy club waiting for the audience to provide a suggestion that my partner and I would use to create an improvised scene. Now, this is how most improv shows work. If you've ever been to an improvisational comedy show before, the audience provides suggestions and then the show is created on the fly around those suggestions. So sometimes the suggestion might be a location where the scene is gonna take place. Sometimes it might be a relationship uh, you know, who are the two people on stage? Are they brothers or twins or co-workers, something like that? Sometimes the suggestion is an object that will drive the scene, a snow shovel, uh, a beach blanket, you know, something that would cause the scene to, to go forward. So on this particular night, my acting partner, Chris, and I are on stage and we have decided we're going to ask the audience for the suggestion of a location. Now, when you ask for a location, you, of course, you never know what you're gonna get. You might get something rather general like France. You know, that's kind of tough. Uh, maybe a little more specific Paris, that'd be a little better. Under the Eiffel Tower, now that would be a good suggestion. That'd be, you could, you could create a specific scene around that. So on this particular night, we got a great location suggestion. The suggestion was 
the corner office of a high rise office building. That's a great specific suggestion. So now what happens is Chris and I turn to each other and one of us needs to initiate something that will get the scene going. Perhaps an opening line of dialogue or a gesture or an action, something that will kick off the scene. And so I turned to my partner, Chris, and I started the scene with an outline of dialogue. I said, thank you for coming to see me. I want to review your job performance from the last several months. Now, what had I done with that opening line? I had established that it sounds like it's my office and, and I'm the boss and, and Chris is my employee and he's come in for some kind of a job performance review. So now Chris needs to respond to my opening line of dialogue. So Chris says back to me, I don't have to listen to you. You're not my boss. So with one line, he kind of negated everything that I was trying to get started with this scene. So now I'm thinking, how can I keep this scene moving? And so I look back at Chris and I said, actually, I am your boss. Apparently, you didn't read the email. And Chris says, I don't read any emails. I don't have a computer. So again, Chris has cut down, stopped everything cold that I was trying to build with this scene. Now see what I needed Chris to do was to hear what I was offering and then build on that. So a much better scene would have been if I said, you know, thank you for coming to see me. I want to review your job performance for the last several months. And Chris could have said back to me, yeah, boss, I have to apologize. I have a rare disease. I sleep 23 hours out of every day. And then I could say, yeah, but in that 24th hour, I need to get more productivity out of you. And Chris could say back, well, the problem is in the 24th hour, I'm going to the doctor to find out why I'm sleeping the other 23 hours or, or something like that. But you see, now the scene is off and running. See, what I needed Chris to do in improv terminology is I needed Chris to say, yes, and. Yes, I hear what you put out there. I accept what you put out there and let me add to it. And that's what keeps a good improv scene going, saying and thinking yes and. What Chris was doing in my example was Chris was saying no, or Chris was saying yes, but. And that was not going to allow a good improvisational scene to be created, there was not going to be any collaboration between Chris and I, because everything I was putting out there, he was negating. In improv terminology, I needed Chris to say yes and. And this is what I want to talk about in our presentation here today, the, the power of thinking and saying yes and. Because if you can imagine in your team environment, in your organizational environment, to create a collaborative environment, to create an environment of open communication. If people hear each other and respond to each other by thinking and saying, yes, and by acting, thinking like an improv actor. That's what we wanna talk about here today. Now, let me give you just a little background about improvisational comedy. Improvisational comedy performance really got its start in Chicago Back in 1959, there were a group of graduate students at the University of Chicago, and they were reading together a book called Improvisation for the Theater by Viola Spolin. And in this book, the author was describing a bunch of improv games and exercises you could play that would make you a better actor. And this group of graduate students reading the books realized that they could use those games, use those improv exercises to actually create a performance all on their own. And that was the start of improv comedy performing and that led to the creation of the famous comedy club in Chicago, the Second City. Second City still in Chicago today, still more popular than ever. A lot of famous American comic actors have gotten their start at Second City. Bill Murray, Tina Fey, uh, Steve Carell. If you remember a few years ago, the famous movie, The Blues Brothers, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, all these actors got their start at the Second City. 
Now, I had the uh, privilege of attending and graduating from the training program at Second City. It was called Players Workshop of Second City. And so that's where I learned how to perform improvisation. It was interesting, the first night of the first class that I went to, I expected to find a room full of aspiring actors like me. And instead, it was very interesting, most of the students in this improv class were business people, professional people, sales people, lawyers, people who simply just wanted to be more comfortable in front of an audience. And so they'd come to the second city to learn how to be improvisers in front of an audience. Now, if I'm gonna ask you to think like an improv actor, you need to understand a little bit more about some of the rules and how improvisation works. So let's look at this picture here. Here we have a group of actors who are in the middle of doing an improv scene. And the first thing you might notice in this picture is there are no objects. They all look like they're holding something. Look at their hands. It looks like maybe they're holding glasses, but there aren't any real glasses, right? They're simply pantomiming. Maybe they're doing a toast at a party or something like that. And this is one of the tenets of improv. You don't use real objects. You pantomime all the objects. Think about it. How can you have real objects? You don't know what the scene is gonna be until you get out on the stage and you get the suggestion and you start creating the scene so you can't have real objects. So everything is pantomime. And this takes a lot of concentration because you can imagine you're holding this glass in your hand and you're doing the scene and you're talking and you're carrying on with whatever is going on. And you have to remember I'm holding a glass in my hand. And every once in a while you'll see the actor uh, just kind of suddenly forget that they're holding a glass. The glass like magically disappears into thin air. Or maybe you've created uh, something physical on the stage like a sink in a kitchen. And of course, it's not really there. You're just pretending it's there and you're washing dishes and somebody else comes along, doesn't realize it, walks right through your sink. You know, so you have to really be focused on these pantomime objects. Another question that often comes up is you look at this picture and you see six actors on stage. And again, remember, there's no script. There was no pre-rehearsal of this scene. So how does this not turn into chaos? Well, there are rules that you follow at any point in time one of the actors on the stage has focus. And so they are talking or gesturing or act actions of some kind, they have focus. And then what happens is that at some point they might decide to give the focus to someone else through a gesture or a line of dialogue or someone else on the stage might decide to take the focus from them. So you're following these rules of give and take where one person at a time has focus on the stage, and this is what prevents it all from turning into chaos. The whole scene is built around the who, the what, and the where. This is where the dialogue comes from. People often say, well, how do you know what to say when you're an improv scene? Well, who are you, where are you, what are you doing? So think about my example, my, my scene with Chris, you know, the who was a boss and an employee, the what was a job performance review, the where was my corner office. And so what would you say if you're a boss giving a performance review in your corner office? That's what drives the dialogue. So you follow these rules, the who, the what, the where, the focus, the give, the take, the pantomiming of objects. This is how you think on stage like an improv actor. Now, the title of my presentation is How Collaboration Energizes Your Team. So what am I thinking when I use the word collaboration? Well, here's a definition. Collaboration is working with others to achieve shared goals. Now, there's a lot of things going on in this definition. First of all, it, it sounds like there's a collection of people, right? You're working with other people. There are goals that have been set. So you have goals in mind that you're aiming towards. And these goals are shared between this group of people that are working together. Collaboration, working with others to achieve shared goals. So what does a collaborative work environment look like? Let's look at a couple characteristics. First of all, I would suggest that the environment is collaborative, not controlling. Think for a minute about a boss, a controlling boss. What does a controlling boss look like? 
A controlling boss, you know, probably keeps all the information to themselves. Maybe if vendors come in to make presentations, the controlling boss only meet, lets the vendors meet and talk with them. Maybe they're afraid of change. They, maybe they're afraid of new technology. Uh, maybe they stifle innovation. The controlling boss says no a lot. Now contrast that with a collaborative boss. A collaborative boss makes sure that everyone's up to date with what's going on, uh, proactively invites the right people to meetings so that everybody knows what's going on. Uh, everybody has the information that they need. A collaborative boss says yes a lot. So a collaborative work environment is collaborative in nature, not controlling in nature. It's also made up of what are called T-shaped professionals. Have you ever heard this expression before? You think of the letter T and the, the top of the T, the horizontal line of the T represents your social skills, your soft skills, your adaptability, uh, 360 degree thinking, you display empathy and curiosity and you have a collaborative uh, work thought in mind. That would be the horizontal line. And then the vertical line of the T represents your technical skill, the depth of your technical skill that allows you to do your job, whatever your job is. So when we talk about a T-shaped professional, it means that we need both. I mean, think about it. What good does it do if you're really good at what you do, the bottom of the T, but you can't get along with anybody on the top of the T. Or what good does it do if you've got great social skills, but you don't know what you're doing? So you really need both. You need T-shaped professionals to create a collaborative work environment. I would also suggest that a collaborative work environment includes folks, members of a team that are practicing deep listening. We're going to talk more about listening here in a few minutes in the presentation, but when you're listening to truly understand, not simply listening to respond, that's deep listening. That's part of a collaborative environment. And finally, it would be an environment filled with trust and respect for each other, the members of your team, the members of your organization. So when I say collaboration can energize your team's performance, this is the kind of work environment that I am picturing. A few years ago in the New York Times, there was an article called How to Get a Job at Google. And the writer here had done some investigation to find out what are some of the characteristics that Google looks for as they hire new employees. And they found things like the ability to process on the fly, a willingness to relinquish power, creating space for others to contribute, learning how to learn from failure. Now, when I looked at this list, what I saw was the job description of an improv actor. I mean, think about it. What do improv actors need to do? They certainly need to process on the fly. They need to be able to relinquish power. I mean, remember the give and take that I was describing. They need to create a space on stage for everyone that's on stage to contribute. And they certainly need to learn from failure when things go wrong in a scene. So here, Google thought these were the characteristics of their employees. What Google didn't realize is who they wanted to hire were improv actors. Okay, so what I wanna do now for the rest of the presentation is take a look at three characteristics of the world of improvisation and that can be used to create this collaborative, team environment that I am describing to you. And so let's drill down a little more on the primary theme here of the presentation, this foundational principle of improvisation called yes and. I mean, this, this is the foundation that allows good improvisational scenes to be created. Now, when you're in class, like the player's workshop that I told you about earlier, there's an exercise that you do in class to try to help you learn about the concept of yes and. And it's a pretty fun exercise. All the students in the class line up in a row and the first person in the row, the first actor in the row, in the row pretends that they're holding an object. Now again, remember, these are 
pantomimed objects. We don't use real objects. So, so let's say, for example, that the first actor in the line pretends that they are holding a ballpoint pen. So they take the ballpoint pen and they do something that's kind of typical for a ballpoint pen, sort of typical. Uh, maybe they write something on, on a note and they hand it to the next person in line. And the next person in line takes the ballpoint pen and goes, yeah, that's true, I can write a note. Let me show you what else I can do. I can draw a mustache under my nose. And then they hand it to the next person in line. And the next person in line takes the ballpoint pen and says, yeah, I can write a note. I can draw a mustache under my nose. I can use this ballpoint pen like a comb. And so maybe they run it through their hair, like they're combing their hair. They hand it to the next person in line. And that person says, yeah, I can write a note. I can draw a mustache. I can comb my hair. And I could use this ballpoint pen to clean the wax out of my ears. And so he cleans the wax out of his ears, hands it to the next actor. The next actor says, yeah, I can do all those things. And watch, I can unscrew the top of the ballpoint pen. The bottom becomes a shot glass. Let's put a little tequila in it and take a shot. So you see what's going on there. Yes, and. Yes, I see what you're offering with the ballpoint pen, and let me add to it. The exercise is called Explore and Heighten. And that builds this thought process for the improv actor of thinking yes, and. You know, people who say no, or people who say yes, but are people who are trying to maintain control of the idea. They're trying to main control, maintain control of the conversation. Have you ever thought about what a crummy word, but, is? You know, it's been a great conference so far this week, but. You know, I really enjoyed that speaker, but. Well, we had a really nice dinner last night, but. You know, it negates everything that you're saying in front of it. Yes, but. To me, is just kind of a polite way of saying no. You know, there's a lot of yes and in the world. Wikipedia is yes and, right? People put out an initial definition of something and there are the people say, yes, I'll take that and I will add to it. Uh, in, your, in the IT world, open source is yes and. Here's some code, I've written some code, I'm gonna put out there for everybody to look at. And then people can say yes and I'm going to add to it. That is thinking and saying, Yes, and. So let's take a look at how we can use this improv concept of yes, and to help create a collaborative team environment. First of all, thinking yes, and affirms and builds. I mean, you can imagine this, right? In the world of improv, it affirms what someone else is saying, and it builds, it adds to it. You know, think about it, saying yes, just the default is often no, right? Do you work in an organization? Do you work in a team where the default answer seems to always be no or yes, but? Because when you say yes, it, it really builds optimism. It allows people to share control. It, it creates this environment of shared communication. And it prevents what in the communication world we call blocking. People who say no are blocking all the time. When people say they have a better idea, when people change the subject, when they're always correcting the speaker, when they're failing to listen, when they're ignoring the situation, those are blocking what could be happening. And saying yes builds optimism. And saying yes and creates this environment of open communication. It affirms and builds. I certainly think it relates to business. Can you imagine being in a problem solving session where people are thinking and saying yes and, or a, or a brainstorming session where you're trying to brainstorm on some way, new way to approach something. People are saying yes and, thinking yes and, I really think it relates to business. Now this next point is a really important point. Saying yes and requires you to trust others to support and build upon their contribution, your contribution, and you to do the same for them. You need to trust others to build on your contribution, and then you need to do the same for them. There's an expression in improvisation when you're creating an improv scene. We say you should bring a brick, not a cathedral. Think about that for a second. Bring a brick, not a cathedral. 
I mean, if I show up at the scene and I've got my whole cathedral already built, then what are the other actors in the improv scene going to contribute? I need to bring one, my idea, my brick, and I add it to the scene and then other people say yes and they add their brick to it. But if everybody shows up with a cathedral, then we're in trouble because everybody's got the whole scene already worked out. There's a great exercise that we play in class that kind of enforces this idea of bring a brick, not a cathedral. And we call the exercise one word at a time. And here's how it works. Again, the students in the class all get in a line and you're going to tell a story one word at a time based on a suggestion from the audience. So let's say that the audience suggestion is fairy tale. So that's the kind of story that the line is gonna tell, but each person is gonna contribute one word at a time. So the story gets going once upon a time. There was a farmer. He lived in the village. He had a magic castle. And so one word at a time, you're creating this story. And I gotta tell you that as an actor, this is a really hard thing to do because as the story is unfolding, you are building a cathedral in your head. And, and then when it's your turn, you only get to contribute one word to the story. And then you have to trust that everyone else is going to build on the story, but you only get to contribute that brick. You only get to contribute one word. And so, you know, once upon a time, there was a farmer who lived in the village. He had a magic, and, and that's my word, magic. He had a magic. And I'm thinking that the actor next to me is going to say castle or barn or, or something like that. And the actor says cow. And I'm like, cow, magic cow. He doesn't have a magic cow. What are you talking about? He has a magic castle, not a magic cow. And, and my problem is that I have built this entire cathedral in my head of what I want this story to look like. And instead, if I'm truly collaborating with all the others in line, I am bringing one brick, I'm bringing one word. Really hard thing to do. This is really important in a collaborative yes and environment is you need to trust others to support and build on your contribution. And then you need to do the same for them. Very important concept. Now, at about this point, people are starting to think, but you can't say yes to everything. And, and, and I don't disagree with that. You can't just run it around going, yes, 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 yes. I, I mean, there has to be some, some thought. And, and so I would say that saying yes and is not a replacement for quality or common sense. You know, there's a time and a place to filter and to edit, but it's probably not at the very beginning. I often think of the example of the sports team. You know, a sports team at the start, they run out onto the court or the pitch or, or the field and they're warming up. So they're not following the rules. They're tossing the ball around. They're running around in and out of bounds, throwing, kicking the ball, whatever. They're not following the rules. And then the referee blows the whistle and then the match starts and then the rules are followed. And I would relate that to yes and. You know, there's a time and a place for editing and filtering, but it's not right at the beginning. But don't forget, it is not a replacement for quality or common sense. Saying yes and gives you the confidence to create something out of nothing. Saying and thinking yes and creates an environment of open communication. You know, in the business world today, we toss around the word team a lot. The executive is putting his team together. Uh, we're all going to go off site and do some team building exercises. Even the title of my presentation, a collaboration energizes your team. Think about it for a minute. What is the definition of a team? Team is a number of persons forming one of the sides in a game or a contest. And so you think about that definition for a minute, and it's got some negative connotation to it. It implies that there's winners and losers, that there's good guys and bad guys. Often a sports team has the starters 
And then there's the bench players. So there's kind of an implied hierarchy of, of the team that some people are better or more important than other people. Not always the best word. At the second city, the group of actors that are on stage performing the improvisational comedy show are known as an ensemble. Much different word, much nicer kind of word, an ensemble. Well, all the parts of the thing are taken together so that each part is considered only in relation to the whole. Very nice definition. The, all the parts are taken together. Each part is considered only in relation to the whole. If you've attended a lot of Second City shows like I have over the years, you come to realize that there's kind of a template of what their ensemble looks like. When you look at the actors on stage, there will always be a, a big goofy guy and a sexy man and a sexy lady and maybe a couple actors that are really good at doing impressions. And so there's this template of what the ensemble looks like. And what's interesting is you go to a show and you see all the actors and the actors don't stay in the show forever, of course, after a few months, you know, maybe one actor leaves and another actor takes their place and the show just keeps on rolling. So if you go back again to see the show after a few months, you might realize that the big goofy guy is gone, but he's been replaced by another big goofy guy because that's what the ensemble needs. Each part is taken together each part is considered in relation to the whole of the ensemble. So let me ask you, how can we help your team become an ensemble as we create this collaborative team environment? Well, first of all, be in the moment. Now, what does this mean in the improv world? In the improv world, if I'm on stage doing an improv show and I'm in the middle of a particular scene, I need to be in the moment of that scene. I can't be thinking about that the last scene didn't go so well. I can't be thinking about what the next scene is probably gonna be, who I'm gonna be doing it with, how I'm gonna be funny or whatever. I need to be in the moment of the scene that I'm in right then. That's what's gonna help the ensemble that I'm on stage with. Now, what about in real life? What does be in the moment look like in real life? Have you ever been talking to someone and in the middle of the conversation, they pull out their cell phone, they start scrolling through their texts. You know, they're not paying attention to you anymore. They are not in the moment. Or have you ever been sitting in a meeting, perhaps in a, around a conference table, everyone's contributing, participating in the meeting and down at the end of the table, there's one guy with his laptop open and he's doing email. He's not paying any attention to the meeting. He's not in the moment. Or have you ever been on a conference call? Everybody's on the call. They've all identified themselves. Discussion is going on. And at some point, somebody says, uh, Joe, what do you think about that? Joe? Hey, Joe, you there? Finally, you hear Joe click back in. He goes, uh, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah, what was Joe doing? He was doing his email, reading the news, taking a nap. Who knows? But Joe was not in the moment. And it's really a matter of respect. Respect for the people you're working with, respect for your ensemble. This is how you change your team into an ensemble. You show respect, you're in the moment. There's also a lot of give and take. Now remember back to when I was describing to you how an improv scene works. Think about it, if all the actors are on stage doing an improv scene and everybody wants to give, and nobody ever wants to take the focus. Or even worse, the scene is going on and everybody's trying to take the focus and nobody's trying to give the focus, the scene would turn into chaos. You need people, you need actors on stage in the ensemble, some who are willing to give and some who are willing to take. And the mode that you're in switches. At some point in the scene, it's your turn to give, at some other point, it's your turn to take. So imagine in your team, your ensemble, your organization, if everyone understood that at some point their role is to give and at other points their role is to take, how much better meetings would be, how much better would gatherings be if people realized that their role switches back and forth. Surrender the need to be right. 
I, I got to tell you, I was doing this session in front of a, a live face-to-face -face audience and there was a lady in the front row. And when this popped up, surrender the need to be right, she kind of rolled her eyes and went, oh no. <laughs> I'm thinking she was probably the person who thought she was always right. And now I was gonna tell her she was gonna have to surrender the need to be right. I could see it all over her face. Let me tell you a story. One of the places in my life, my personal life, where I have had the opportunity to really use my improv skills, believe it or not, is at the church that I attend. And at the church that I attend, there's a drama troupe that is based on improvisational uh, techniques. And, and we create scenes from time to time that are performed as part of the worship service at the church on Sunday morning. So here's how this works. Uh, during the week, the pastor, the minister has decided that uh, he's gonna preach a sermon on honesty. And so he shoots me a note and he says, hey, uh, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be talking about honesty on Sunday. I'd like the troop to do a little scene about honesty. So I send an email out to all the members of the troop that say, okay, the theme this week is honesty. Think about it, come with your ideas to a rehearsal on Saturday morning and we will use improvisational technique to create a scene for the Sunday morning service. There is one guy in our troop who shows up on Saturday morning and he always brings a cathedral and he's always right. And this makes the rehearsal, the development process, the creative process really tough because he's not just bringing his brick, he's got the whole cathedral, he's got the whole scene worked out and he knows that he's right. And so it's really a challenge to get other people involved, to get other people to contribute, to try to see what other ideas are out there because this guy has showed up and he does not wanna surrender the fact that he knows that he is right. And this really hurts an ensemble, a true collaborative ensemble. The members of the team and the ensemble are willing to surrender the need to be right. Saying yes and creating this culture of open communication by being in the moment, by giving and taking, switching roles as necessary and surrendering the need to be right. This is what builds better ensembles. So we've talked about yes and the power of that. We've talked about turning your team into an ensemble. The third thing I wanna look at today is listening. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that when actors are on stage creating an improvisational comedy show, listening is critical. I have to be listening to what the other people are saying. I have to hear what they're saying so I know what's being created so I can say, yes, I hear what you're saying and I can add to it. If I, my mind is wandering and I'm not listening, then I'm not able to make that contribution. Again, there's an exercise that we play in class. It's a simple exercise. You could do it easily with one other person. You get two people and they're having a conversation. But the rule of the conversation is that when one person is done contributing to the conversation, the last word that they have said has to be the first word that the other person says. So we're doing this conversation back and forth and I have to wait all the way until you are done and I hear the last word that you say and then I use that as my first word. So think about what that does. That means that I can't be thinking in advance what I'm going to say because I don't know what your last word is going to be. It really causes you to have to listen all the way to the very end. So let's look at some concepts of listening. First of all, great listening, I'm sure you understand this, is at the core of great improvisation as I described. There's a concept in improv that we call follow the follower. And there's a game that we play to, to reinforce this. So take all of the members of the, of the class and you get in a circle and one person starts and they start doing something. Maybe they start clapping. And so everyone says, oh, okay, I see. They're the leader, they're clapping. We're all gonna follow along. So everyone starts clapping. And after a few moments of clapping, anyone else in the circle that wants to decides that they're gonna become the leader. And so they stop clapping and maybe they start, I don't know, patting their head. 
And everyone kind of looks around and goes, oh, I see, they're the leader now. And so everyone stops clapping and starts patting their head. And then after a few moments of that, someone else decides they're going to be the leader. And so they stop patting their head and maybe they start humming to themselves. <laughs> and everyone goes, oh, they're the leader now. They stop patting their head and they start humming. And this concept is called following the follower. Any member of the ensemble can assume leadership whenever they want. So again, imagine that you're on stage and you're doing this improvisational show. If one guy takes the focus and never lets go, he's always the leader. Pretty soon it just turns into a one-man show that is not a collaborative environment. And so what you need to do is be able to follow from one to another. We call that following the follower. You know, true leadership is about understanding the status of what's going on, not always trying to maintain the status. Let me say that again. Good leadership is not about maintaining the status. It's about understanding the status. Who was it in the circle that was at any point in time the leader? That's following the follower. And right along with that, then if you are doing a good job of following the follower, that means you must be reading the room. You understand what the mood is in the room, who the people are, how they're contributing, how they're feeling, how they're thinking. These two go together very well, following the follower and reading the room. There's a, a really funny, uh, famous story that comes out of the Second City that illustrates this. Uh, there was an organization that needed a speaker for their monthly meeting. And so they called up the Second City and asked if the Second City could provide a speaker for their monthly meeting. And the Second City said, sure. And so the day of the meeting came and one of the actors from Second City showed up to give a speech at the monthly meeting of the organization. And apparently there was a misunderstanding and the organization thought they were getting a subject matter expert to speak to them about the subject that was the expertise of their organization. And the guy that came from Second City, he didn't know anything at all about the expertise of their organization. Undaunted, he decided to get up in front of the group and give a speech anyway. So he gets up in front of the group and he says, what is one of the biggest challenges that you are facing today? And someone raises her hand and suggests something. And he goes, yeah, that sounds really tough. What can we do about that? And some people offer some suggestions and he kind of summarizes and he says, okay, what's another challenge that you're facing today? And someone else raises her hand and says, yes, oh, that sounds like a really tough challenge. What can we do about that? And he went on and on like that for an hour Challenges, solutions, challenges, solutions, all coming from the audience. At the end of the hour, he finished. The audience gave him a standing ovation. He didn't even know what he was talking about. But what was he doing? He was reading the room and he was following the follower. And he brought great value to that group that day. That's good listening. Another thing that listening can help you do is make mistakes work for you. Now in the world of improv, when you're doing a show like I've been describing to you, in every scene, you know, an actor like myself, I'd be playing some something different. So in one scene, it might be Glenn, the uh, taxi driver. And in the next scene, it might be Glenn, the uh, doctor. And in the next scene, it might be Glenn, the server in a restaurant. And the problem is this gets kind of confusing that Glenn is all these different things. And so what you do as you're doing the show is you change your name from scene to scene to imply that you're a different person. So in one scene, you're Joe and then Fred and then George. And so that shows the audience that you're playing different people. And so the other actors that are on stage, of course, have to keep track of this. And this could be kind of difficult. And one night I was on stage and I was doing a scene and the name that I had given myself in the scene was Joe. And my fellow actor that was doing the scene with me, he apparently got confused about what my name was in the scene and he accidentally called me George. Now, the audience realized he'd made a mistake. 
I realized he'd made a mistake, but he did not realize he'd made that mistake. So instead of simply just correcting him, I decided to use this and make this mistake work for us. And so when he called me George instead of Joe, I recoiled in horror and I looked around and I said, who told you about my secret identity? And that created a whole new theme of spies and things like this. And the scene went off from there. I used his mistake. I used it to work for me, but I realized it was happening because I was listening. I was in the moment, I was listening. And this then kind of leads to this summary thought. I brought this up earlier in the presentation that true listening is about listening to understand, not just listening to respond. This is what that little game is all about, the conversation exercise that I described a few minutes ago. If I have to wait all the way until you're done talking, I hear everything that you have to say, and then I formulate my response. Think about it. How does listening usually work? Someone's talking to you, and you're half hearing what they are saying, and mostly you are thinking about what you're going to say as soon as they stop talking, and that is listening to respond. That is not listening to truly understand. I think most business people fall into the trap of simply listening to respond when they need to listen to understand. So let's summarize what, what I've covered here so far. Collaboration, folks, energizing your team, your organization, your ensembles, performance is all about thinking like an improv actor. So we talked first about yes and, the power of yes and, it creates a culture of open communication. We talked about how to turn your team into an ensemble. Remember being in the moment, understanding the roles of give and take, surrendering the need to be right. This is how you turn your team into an ensemble. And then thirdly, we talked about listening. Listening to understand, not listening to simply respond. So thinking like an improv actor, thinking and saying yes and, turning your team into an ensemble, listening to understand. There are a lot of great books that have been written about what I've been talking about here today. Uh, these are three that I would recommend to you if you'd like some additional resources. Uh, the book on the left is particularly fun, appropriately titled Yes And Lessons from Second City, How Improvisation Reverses No But Thinking and Improves Creativity and Collaboration. And this book was written by two guys who work at the Second City in Chicago. And, and actually, they work in the arm of Second City that does business consulting. This is kind of interesting. You can actually hire some of the actors from Second City to come to your company and take you through some of the exercises I've told you about today and help you kind of build that collaborative environment and thinking yes and. And so this book is a collection of things that those guys learned as they did those various consulting engagements. Really fun book if you want to learn more about Second City, learn more about improv and explore some of the things I've shared with you here today a little bit more. Uh, the second book there, also written by a, a former actor from Second City, Getting to Yes and the Art of Business Improv. And then this third book is a really fun little book, Improv Wisdom. Don't prepare, just show up. <laughs> kind of an interesting thought that's built around the world of, of improv. Now, what I'd like to do to summarize and, and send you away with some, some positive thoughts about what I've been sharing today is I'd like to share with you what I call advice from the world of improv. And this, I, I took this from the first book there, the, the Lessons from Second City Yes End book. This is how they wrap up their book, is what we have here are 24 kind of summary points Again, advice from the world of improv. So I'm gonna show these 24 points to you here, one at a time. And I'd like you to just kind of let them sort of wash over you. Some of these could really help you 
as you create this ensemble collaboration environment that we've talked about with, with the folks you work with. Some of these might help you in life. They're just good life lessons to take away from our presentation today. So just think about these, ruminate on them, let them kind of flow over you as I share these 24 points with you. Look people in the eye when you meet them. Again, think about that in the context of the ensemble that you're trying to create out of your team. Smile. You know, people like it when there's happiness around. If you smile, it's contagious. Other people are going to smile. Don't check your text or email when someone else is talking. We talked about this. This is a matter of respect. Right, and that's what creates an ensemble. Be curious. I mean, my gosh, I, I mean, I worked for decades and you are all still working in, in an industry, the IT industry, where every day you're inundated with new technology, new thoughts, new creativity. What a place to be curious. Make sure you're being curious about that. Try to eliminate the word no from your vocabulary for just one day. I was doing this presentation in front of a live audience and there was a lady, uh, she raised her hand and she said, I have young children at home, this is not possible. Uh, okay, maybe in that situation it's not. But can you imagine going through your entire business day dealing with your, your team, your organization, the task force, the colleagues that you work with, and eliminating the word no for just one day. Give it a try. When you're wrong, acknowledge it, say you're sorry, move on. Forgive yourself and forgive others. I mean, everybody is going to screw up. You're going to screw up. The other guy is going to screw up. So be willing to forgive yourself and forgive other people. Lead as you would want to be led. If you're in a position of leadership and your team, your organization, this is kind of the golden rule of business, I think. Lead as you would want to be led. Be on time. Let me tell you guys, nothing to me can be a cancer on an ensemble more than when someone is always late. It disrespects the other members of the ensemble. When you're waiting to start the conference call, you're waiting to start the meeting, it's that same person is late all the time. Be on time. Excel at preparation. You know, we often think about excelling at execution. You know, hopefully in this last hour, I have excelled as I have delivered this presentation to you. But did I excel when I was preparing? when I was thinking up the charts, when I was doing research, when I was rehearsing the presentation, was I excelling at preparation? You know, back in my younger days when I was uh, doing a lot of improvisational performing and, and working with the classes at Second City and all of that, my friends would say, so what are you doing tonight? And I would say, oh, I'm going to improv practice. And they kind of shake their head and go, how can there be improv practice? Uh, how can you practice? You're, you're making it up. There's nothing to practice. And that, of course, is not true. There are all the rules of things I've told you about, we had to practice over and over again so that on stage on the weekend, we were ready to go excel at preparation. Ask yourself, what is the problem you are trying to solve? I just think this is a universally great question to be asking. You know, when you've gathered, when your team is gathered, when your task force is gathered, Ideas are being kicked around, problem solving, creativity, whatever. Technologies are being offered as solutions. Other things are being offered as solutions. Don't lose sight. What is the problem you are trying to solve? It's my favorite question. Make your partner look good. In the story I told you back at the beginning, my partner, Chris, he was not making me look good. He might have been getting laughs. He was saying some funny stuff, but he was shutting down the scene. He was shutting down what I was contributing. You want to, in improv, make your partner look good on stage. And in your ensemble, 
you want to make the partner, the colleagues, the people you work with look good. Respect, don't revere. To me, the word revere means that you are afraid to change something. You won't ever change it. You revere it. I think you can respect something and still be willing to change. Respect, don't revere. Listen to the whole person. And right along with that, reading the room, understanding the mood, what people are saying with their body language. Listen to the whole person, read the room. Share the conversation. Don't be that controlling leader of your team. Be the collaborative leader of your team that shares the conversation. Love your work. I hope you love your work. If you don't love your work, I hope you can go find some work that you do love. Applaud others. Let other people know that you know that they did a good job. Say we rather than I whenever possible. This creates the ensemble environment that I'm talking about. Consider that you might not be right. Remember the story I told about my acting friend and my church drama troupe? Open your door. Literally, I mean, do you work in an office where you have a door? Open the door, leave it open. Who knows what interesting thing might wander in. Try not to work out of fear. Work from a sense of possibility. I'm always so sad when I meet people at conferences or whatever that tell me that they're really working out of fear. They're, they fear for their job. Or they fear that they're going to get a bad performance review. They're afraid of their boss. Work from a sense of possibility. What can happen when you create this collaborative ensemble? Understand the audience you're trying to win over and give them a role. In the improv world, we give a role to the audience. They are providing the suggestions. That's their role. And, and the audience is who we're trying to win over. Do you know who you're trying to win over? That department uh, in your company that hates IT, you know, give them a role, get them involved. Understand who you're trying to win over, give them a role. And finally, be an improviser. Think like an improv actor. I've given you a ton of ways to do that today. And overall, the number one way to think like an improv actor, to be an improviser, is to think and say yes and so this is me these days uh, after i retired from ibm i have my own little speaking company there i would love to hear from you shoot me an email you can see my email there check out my website there's some videos and some other interesting things out on my website uh, if you could ever imagine that i could bring some value to your team uh, your organization, the company that you work for, get in touch with me. This is what I'm doing these days in my kind of semi-retirement after I, I left my uh, IBM years behind. So get in touch. I, I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear what, what you think about the things that I'm doing and, and sharing these days. So that is me. Uh, I'm sure you're all by now uh, familiar with the charity that the GSA UK conference is involved with. So Yes, I will be giving you the charity and you should be giving to the charity too. And finally, I'm sure you're getting in the swing of submitting session feedback. So here's the, uh, the information for this session, 5AJ. Would love to get your feedback on what we've shared with you here today. So Anna, that is what I have for you today. If there's any comments or questions or time to wrap up. <clears throat> Thank you, Glenn. It was truly fantastic presentation, and I'm sure everyone was enjoying this. And I just, you know, can echo what the the attendees are saying in the chat. That it was very interesting and enlightening. So thank you so much, Glenn, one more time for uh, presenting for your time. It was really the highlight, you know, of this day of the GSC conference. Thank, thank you. Glenn. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.